Welcome to Philosophy with Tim Jacobs. Let's talk about Aristotle's organon, specifically his categories. Aristotle lived around 384 to 322 BC. He started a school named the Lyceum where he could teach his students philosophy, particularly logic. But what is logic? Logic studies truth, which is the conformity of the mind to reality, the correspondence of a proposition, I believe, to the reality out there. It's the natural order of the universe. It's not mathematical symbolic logic. It's not Western or Eastern. It's not relativism. Logic is about the structure of the universe insofar as I can understand it. The Organon is a collection of Aristotle's works that launched the field of logic. And it's these six works. Starts off with the categories, then on interpretation, prior analytics, posterior analytics, topics, and on sophistical refutations. Today we're just talking about the categories. Well, there are 10 categories that we're going to talk about. The first is substance which we will actually cover last. And then nine accidents. But what is a category? What is a substance? What are accidents? Let's start with the basics. So Aristotle makes sure that we're clear on different kinds of terms in order to avoid confusion. Categories will seem like a work of physics or maybe biology, but it's logic because it clarifies definitions. And definitions are of things that we understand. So logic studies the intelligibility of things. In the intellect, there are three acts of the mind. The first is understanding of concepts using terms. The second is judgment by combining terms into propositions to determine the truth. A proposition can be true or false. A term cannot be true or false. And then reason by combining propositions into arguments, we discover conclusions. Categories deals with understanding. The concepts that we understand are universals, which are similarities of forms in things. Forms are qualities. Homonymous terms or equivocal terms are, as Aristotle says, when things have only a name in common, but the definitions are different. So for example, an actual man and a picture of a man. We might say, oh, that's a man, or a bat, a bat, and a bat. Synonymous terms, or univocal, are the same name with the same meaning in the definition of both. So for a man and an ox, both have animal in their definition because man is the rational animal and oxen are brute animals. And animal means the same thing in both, as we'll talk about later. Peronymous terms, or analogical terms, is where one term derives from another term or has partially similar meaning. A grammarian, in Aristotle's example, gets its name from grammar. The brave get their name from bravery. Now let's talk about what we understand, how we understand, and how that leads to the ten categories. Aristotle is an empiricist, which means knowledge starts from observation. By observing similar objects and subtracting their differences, we can understand universal categories. Let's look at the example of several different kinds of trees. We can observe their similarity by subtracting their differences, like their color, or some other differences, like some of their, their shape or their fruit, different things like this, until eventually we're just left with a simple concept of tree that applies to all trees universally. Trees have a canopy, a trunk, and roots, sort of a minimal common denominator. Abstraction is the process of observing forms or qualities in things, subtracting differences, and understanding similarities as universals. So let's take a broader scope of things, not just trees, but flowers and bushes. We can take the universal concept of a bush and the universal concept of a flower, but let's subtract some more differences. What's the difference between a flower, a tree, and a bush? Let's subtract some of those differences until we just have the idea of a plant. Plant is a concept 
that universally applies to trees, flowers, and bushes. What about other things? Let's get broader and broader, more and more inclusive. What about people and animals? Let's subtract some more differences and now we just have life, living things. Let's incorporate even more. What about non-living things like a chair or immaterial things like spirits? Eventually we're going to get up to mere existence and being. But let's back up. Think about the number five, or a shape, or distance. We might categorize those under quantity. Next, we might organize qualities like color, or half full, or temperature. Next, where something is, a place, location, things like this under another category. These are starting to introduce Aristotle's categories. We have when which is time, or relation, or being affected, or affecting something else, or position, or possession. We can remember these by an acronym, Q-W-R-A-P. Q-RAP includes all of these nine accidents. Now the ten categories, as you recall, are the nine accidents and substance. So let's add an S to the beginning because it's actually first. SQ wrap is an easy way to remember the 10 categories. But what is a substance? Well a substance is a subject. Think about subject and predicate forming a sentence. A substance is a subject, a particular thing, an individual person. For example, Aristotle or my dog Spot or my orange tree. These are particular individual things. Individual is the key word here. And subject. Aristotle said that a substance is not said of a subject and it's not said in a subject. It is neither said of or in a subject. What does that mean? Well human is said of Aristotle. So human is not itself a substance. Color is said to be in the dog or in the orange tree. So color is not a substance. Now we're talking here about a primary substance, the primary meaning of a substance. So what is said of a subject? Let's go back to thinking about subject and predicate. There are five different kinds of predicate. Genus, difference, species, property, and accident. These are the five predicables. They are introduced by Aristotle's topics and developed by Porphyry's introduction to the categories, or Isagog. Let's get back to our example of trees. Tree is a kind of thing. It's a category, a group of beings. But what about plant? Plant is a broader category, a broader genus. But what's the difference between plant and tree? That's where we introduce difference as a predicable. A tree has canopy, trunk, and roots. Well, flowers also have roots. So that can't be the difference. That's a commonality. We also want to steer clear of accidents, which are things like color or things that are not related to the essence or the very definition of what it is to be a tree or a plant. We also want to steer away from property. Property is something that's not in the definition of what it is to be a tree or a plant, but comes from the definition, as we'll talk about again later. So canopy and trunk probably are going to be properties and not difference, but for now it's okay. We'll talk about canopy or trunk or whatever the difference might be. Once we have genus and difference, that produces the species. Think of genus and species as a relationship, as broader and narrower categories. The species here is tree, where the genus is plant. This is a relational description. Now we can think within the category tree, you have cherry trees and you have pine trees. What's the difference between those two? Well, the difference is going to create the species. At some point we stop and we just say, here is the species cherry. And in fact, in scientific classification, when we designate a species, we designate it by the genus 
first and then by the species. So genus, difference, and species combine to form the essence of a thing. How does that relate back to subject? Well, the essence is said of a subject. As we said, human is said of Aristotle. Human is Aristotle's essence. When we ask, what is that thing? Or, what is it? The answer is going to be a definition. It's going to be the essential form of the thing. What is Aristotle? He's a human. What is that animal? It's a dog. What is that plant? It's an orange tree. This relates to its essence, the definition, which includes the genus, difference, and species. Essence is also known as secondary substance. That's why we're dwelling on it so long. Essence equals the species, which equals the genus plus the difference. For example, human is the genus or category animal plus rational. Those designations relate to different powers or abilities that we'll talk about later. Aristotle, Spot, and my orange tree are not essences. They are not secondary substances. They are not said of a subject. They are a subject, that is to say, a primary substance. Remember, we have primary substance, which is a subject, an individual subject, and secondary substance, which is an essence or a definition. With the five predicables, we can apply the ten categories to define the essence of different species. This is the root of scientific classification, founded on Aristotle and applied by Porphyry. Porphyry's tree is a method of classifying beings and substances that he developed. Let's start with being. Anything that exists is a being of some kind. We can separate that into the ten categories by saying, some things are a substance, a subject, a being, and some things that exist are qualities of substances. Substance is being, which you might call a genus, plus an essence, which is the difference. So every subject, every fundamental primary substance must have some kind of essence or definition of what it is. It's not a quality, it's not said of a subject, it's not said in a subject, it is a subject because it has an essence. These are the 10 categories. We can split substance now into immaterial substances or spirits and material substances. So material substances are a substance with an essence, which is a genus, and matter, which is the difference. The difference between material substances and immaterial substances is one is made of matter. By definition, material substances matter. Material substances can be split into inanimate things, like atoms and elements, or animate things. So a plant, for example, is a material substance. That's the genus, and it has the nutritive power. That's the difference. Power is an ability or a faculty. Nutritive is also called vegetative. This is the basic power of life, of self-animation. This comes from Aristotle's On the Soul, or De Anima. Animate things can be split into plant and animal. Animals are animated living substances, that's the genus, and the sensitive power, that's the difference. The sensitive power is the five senses. This is also called sentience because it senses something. The sensitive power gives rise to the appetitive power, which is pleasure, pain, emotion, passions. As soon as you can sense things outside yourself, you can also have some degree of pleasure and pain, whether it's very simple in simple organisms or very complex in more complex organisms. The sensitive power also gives rise to the locomotive power. Some things have the power of self-motion towards pleasurable things and away from painful things in some form or fashion. There are five powers of life total. The vegetative, the sensitive, the appetitive, and the locomotive we've already talked about. And then the last will be our last difference. From animal we have brute separated out from human. The last power is the rational power. Humans are animal, which is genus, animal being defined as an animate substance with the sensitive power and the difference of having the rational power. That's why the human nature is called rational animal. That's our essence. Let's get back to subject and predicate and the five predicables. What is said of a subject? We said that's the essence. 
The essence, or the definition, the essential form, is a secondary substance. That differs from a primary substance, which is an individual subject, like Aristotle, my dog Spot, or my orange tree. Secondary substances might include human, or Jack Russell Terrier, or Citrus sinensis. These are essences, or species. So an essence is said of a subject. Now let's talk about the accidental predicates. You'll notice that accident is listed here twice. In one sense, accident just refers to what is essential versus what is non-essential in the definition of what a thing is. But there's a more specific sense of accident as well, which is a quality of something that's not always present, like color or size. But a property is the effect of the essence. It's always present. A property is still said of a subject. For example, having the rational power means that we are a social or linguistic or the political animal. This is a definition by property. It's not the most perfect kind of definition because it doesn't speak straight to the essence of the thing, but it is still a good and accurate definition. Most of our definitions will end up being by property or even by accident. A little bit less than perfect, but still an accurate definition nonetheless. The rational power also makes us risible or able to laugh. Sometimes we're called the risible animal. We understand humor in a way that animals do not. These are differences between humans and animals. They are effects of our primary difference. They don't speak to the heart of the essence of what it is to be human, but they are still differences. They are still effects of our essence. So we won't call these differences per se. We'll call these properties because they are properly an effect or a property of the difference, an effect of the difference. So what is said in a subject? That's going to be an accident. An accident is not always present. For example, color or size or age. Not all humans have the same color, size or age. It's not always present when you have a human. But the genus, difference, species and property are always going to be present with every human. Another example definition would be a triangle. A triangle is a three-sided difference. Plane figure. Genus. What kind of thing is it? It's a plane figure. A figure that is two-dimensional on a plane. And the difference between it and a square or a pentagon is that it's three-sided. This is a definition by essence of a triangle. But a property will be that the interior angles sum to 180. That's a property of triangles. If you have a triangle, you will always have this property. Every triangle has this property. But accidental qualities might be the specific angles of each of the three angles or how big the area of the triangle or even perhaps the color of the triangle. Remember that substance in the primary sense is an individual thing with an essence like Aristotle. Secondary substance is an essence or a species. The very definition of the essence of Aristotle is going to be human or for an inanimate substance would be H2O. This is kind of a form, a formula. We also have artificial substances, which is to say something man-made like a chair or a house. It's not really a substance, it's just kind of a convention, something that we invented and we've decided to call a thing, but it's not essentially a whole united thing with an essence of its own. What happens when two substances join? For example, when someone drinks a cup of water. They become one substance. The water and the person become one substance. Remember, a substance is a subject. Oftentimes today, we tend to think of substance in clinical or scientific terms, where substance means some sort of compound or solution or primary material out of which other things are made. That's not this philosophical definition of substance. Substance just means an individual subject. So when we look over there, that subject, that individual thing is a person. In the end, we only have one subject. But water still acts like water inside the body and can become a subject if separated from the body. Aristotle says some things are potentially while others are actually. The constituents combined in a compound can be, in a sense, and yet not be in another sense when these substances combine. For example, in a water molecule, you have H2O, which is two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Combined, they form something new. 
water. Water is neither hydrogen nor oxygen. But hydrogen and oxygen are still potentially in the things, while others are actually. The constituents combined in a compound can be in a sense and yet not be. The compound, like water, may be actually other than its constituents from which it has resulted. Water is different than hydrogen or oxygen. It's a different substance. Nevertheless, each of the parts may be potentially what it was before they were combined, and both of them may survive undestroyed. So a water molecule can still be separated back into its parts, back into different substances. Now remember, a substance is a subject, so it will split into three atoms, three substances. The constituents, therefore, neither persist actually, nor are they destroyed, either one of them or both, for their power of action is preserved. This is from Aristotle on generation and corruption. So now we, what we have is virtual presence. This is when a substance is subsumed in another, a compound wholly different from and more than the sum of its parts. Water is more than just a collection of hydrogen and oxygen. Some properties of its parts may remain. For example, water inside the human body. Let's get back to the 10 categories. The 10 categories are universals, as we mentioned before. Are there any universals that are more universal than the 10 categories? What's broader? When we subtract the differences, what do we get at the next higher level of universal? Let's talk broadly about universals. First, we start by observing particulars. Then we categorize their similarities by subtracting differences. We continue this process, and then we categorize species and genera. Continue this process, and eventually you have some very broad categories. The 10 categories are understood in this way. These are universals that are learned by observing similarities. The categories are concepts, terms, or forms that universally apply to everything in that category. But they're limited universals because what's in one category isn't in another, like color and love are totally different categories. Each category refers to a limited number of beings. Are there any universals that are more universal? We mentioned before we have being. Being is the most universal universal because it applies to everything. Anything that exists is some kind of being. This universal is unqualified and unlimited. Being as being. Being in its most general sense. That's the study of metaphysics. So being is more universal than the 10 categories, but there's an in-between level. What is being in relation to the concept of wholeness or unity? We call it one. What is being in relation to intellect or understandability? We call it true. What is being in relation to striving or desire? We call it good. These are called the transcendentals. We call them unlimited because they apply to all beings. Everything in one of these groups is also in all of the rest. Everything under true is also in good. These transcendentals are also convertible, which means they refer to the same object or objects as different aspects of it. So any being has a quality of being true, one, and good. It is one individual being. It has goodness in the sense of perfection or imperfection about what it is. Is it fulfilling its essence? Or true, we can make true and false statements about it. It's a subject, so there can be predicates said about it that can be true or false. We can understand what the thing is. The transcendentals are also coextensive with being, which means that all three of these are talking about being under three different angles. You might call them different names of being in relation to different aspects of something. So when we talk about a being, we can talk about what's true about them, which is also going to be convertible into talking about what's good about them or what makes them a whole united single being. And that's it for talking about the categories and launching off Aristotle's discussion of logic in the Organon. Join me in future videos as we discuss his other works.